All right. <clears throat> so we will go ahead and get started here. So thank you guys for coming out on the rainy night. <laughs> Uh, my name is Eric. I'm the environmental scientist for the Clinton River Watershed Council. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about landscaping for butterflies, bees, all sorts of pollinators actually, uh, and clean water. I'm going to touch on some different things as far as clean water goes that native landscaping can help you with. Uh, I'm also going to touch on some issues that we deal with within the watershed and how you guys can make a difference that way. <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions during, feel free, raise a hand. So to start things out, I'm going to go over a little bit of who we are as an organization, the Clinton River Watershed Council. We are a local nonprofit. Uh, we're based out of Rochester Hills. Uh, our mission is to protect, enhance, and celebrate the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair. Uh, we are supported by membership, including individual, business, local government, and community members. Uh, we're also funded through local government memberships, such as stormwater education plans and things like that, uh, and grants. We do quite a bit of grant work around the watershed. Uh, six staff working in three programs er program areas if we were fully staffed. Uh, we work in education, stewardship, and watershed management are our three main areas. Each one of those areas has multiple programs or initiatives underneath it. So to start things out, I'll just kind of go over the basics a little bit. Uh, what is a watershed? So a watershed is an area of land uh, or a region that drains into a central point. So anywhere you're standing on land, you're within the watershed of something. Here in Clarkston, we're within the, water, the Clinton River watershed. If you go to, say, Ann Arbor, you'd be in the Huron River watershed, and so on and so forth. So once again, anywhere you're standing in the world, you're within the watershed of something. It could be a lake, it could be a river, it could be an ocean. Uh, they are divided by uh, topographic divides, which are just areas of high land. That's what... If water falls on this side, it'll roll this way. If it falls on this side, it's going to roll the other way. Uh, so some of the things that come along with being in a watershed are things such as surface runoff or stormwater, which I'll get into in just a second. Uh, the other one is different kinds of water bodies. So you can have all the surface waters all draining to one point. So everything that hits the ground up here in Clarkson eventually is going to make its way out to Lake St. Clair. <clears throat> This is the Clinton River watershed, as well as Anchor Bay right here and Lake St. Clair direct drainage. This whole colored area is our service area. This is where we do all of our initiatives. So the Clinton River watershed covers uh, areas of four different counties. We're about 50% of Oakland County, about 90% of Macomb County, and then we've got a little corner of Lapeer and St. Clair up here. Uh, the Clinton River watershed itself is 760 square miles. Uh, about 63 communities live within the Clinton River watershed, and then there's 12 additional communities in Anchor Bay and Lake St. Clair direct drainage. With that many communities within our boundary, uh, we are the most densely populated watershed in the state. Uh, we have over 1.5 million people living within our boundaries. So with that comes a lot of things that can cause issues. With a lot of people, you have a lot of development. So kind of getting into that, uh, the Clinton River has come a long way uh, from its historical being. Uh, 45 years ago, the Clinton River was known as one of the most polluted rivers in the state. Uh, now, today, with the help of organizations like ours and many others, uh, we've been able to bring it back. So we've got a lot of things to be proud of. Uh, the Clinton River is a popular fishery for anglers. Lake St. Clair is a world-renowned bass fishery among other fish. Uh, Paint Creek is one of the last remaining cold water trout streams in southeast Michigan. And we have plenty of other areas that are actually uh, very diverse biologically. Uh, that's what right here, diverse populations of native flora and fauna, which I'll get into a little bit in this presentation. Uh, and the Clinton River is also a very popular destination for paddlers and recreational users now. Uh, we are a water trail in the state, and it draws in. We have sections that are very slow, easy paddling. We also have sections that can be very technical and very quick. 
So we draw in a lot of different paddlers from around the area. But with those things, we do still have some impairments and the reason why we kind of exist and we're trying to change these things. We have some issues with some bacterial contamination from combined sewer overflows and failing septic systems. Uh, we do have some contaminated sediments that persist from before the Clean Water Act passage. And we do have some habitat uh, degradation from development, first and foremost, and also invasive species. And a lot of people don't realize the impact of invasive species, but it can be very detrimental. Uh, and stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is the single greatest issue that we deal with on the watershed scale, hands down. Everybody hears about the combined sewer overflows or the contaminated sediments, stuff like that, but nobody ever thinks about the stormwater issue. And stormwater is just as detrimental, if not worse, on a larger scale. So what is stormwater runoff? Uh, if you think about developed area and what an impervious surface is, this table, for example, is an impervious surface. If I took a bottle of water and poured it off on top of this table, it's going to run off the top. If I took a bottle of water and poured it in a bed of soil, it's going to filter through that soil eventually. So this would be impervious. So anytime it rains and it hits an impervious surface, such as a parking lot, a roof, a sidewalk, whatever the case may be, the water is going to run off the top of that surface and it's going to pick up anything that's on it and continue to t carry it down to what's called a storm drain. Common misconception is these iron grates that you see alongside the roads go into the sewer. Nine times out of ten they do not. What it's going to do is this will go into this grate, it's going to go through a pipe into the closest river. No filtration, no treatment, no anything. That's when issues can occur. So if you think about all the different contaminants that you see on the roadways, so you can think salt, oil, trash, litter, and then you can think about uh, some of the contaminants coming off of large scale agriculture or even the individual lawn who may be fertilizing too much and all that excess fertilizer is running off into the storm drain. These cause lots and lots of issues for any surface water body. Uh, so what are some of those impairments and what can this runoff cause? So runoff from impervious surfaces, like I said, contains a lot of pollutants, both humans, from both hu humans and animals. Things such as dirt, oils, fuels, salts, trash, pesticides, fertilizers, the list goes on. Once those things get into the storm drain and make their way into our surface waters, they can have a detrimental effect from the time it enters into the river to the time it makes it out to the lake. So things such as sediment is a big one. Uh, sediment can harm uh, predatory fish. It can also fill in important fish uh, breeding habitats. And then you can also think about on the fertilizer pesticides, you could think about uh, harmful algal blooms if you can remember Lake Erie and what happened down there a few years ago and what continues to happen down there. Uh, that's caused by an influx of nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrate. So yeah, those are just some examples. Uh, another thing that comes along with a lot of development that people kind of have a hard time connecting is this idea of river flashiness. So river flashiness is basically where your flow can go way up and then it can drop way down very quickly in a rain event. When that happens, you can have large scale erosion like what you can see down here, which increases that sediment load and can cause tremendous property damage. <clears throat> And then if you look at it at a larger scale, this is kind of the scary part. So within the Great Lakes, uh, there's about 21% of the world's fresh surface water. About one-fifth of the fresh water supply is in our backyards. About 84% of North America's fresh surface water. And uh, you can see about 25% is used for Canadian agriculture, 7% for American agriculture. So this resource is extremely important to us moving forward, and not only us here in Michigan or in the United States, but also some of our fellow countries and our neighbors. Uh, so it's very important that we try to protect these resources in the long run. <coughs> and so now kind of changing things a little bit and looking at what else environmental degradation and uh, stormwater and things like that, what else they can affect. Uh, many of the factors that affect water quality also affect things such as pollinators, plants, and our local ecosystems. 
And they do this in a uh, multitude of ways that I'm going to kind of get into here. Uh, first one would be loss of native vegetation and habitat. So if you think about all the development within the watershed and you think about how much of that habitat is now gone, that's a big problem when it comes to saving things such as bees and monarchs, which are both threatened species now. Uh, more erratic climate. Uh, this is a large scale concept, so when you look at how the climate is changing over time, the more we develop and the more impact we have on our natural ecosystem, the less apt it is to adapt to these climate changes in the long run. And then the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Those are um, pretty obvious detrimental things to the natural ecosystem. A lot of people seem to think that a healthy lawn is one that's been fertilized a bunch and it's bright green. That's not true. Uh, most of the time that lawn is being overproductive and you're actually hurting your soil, number one, and you're hurting your local water quality every time it rains. <clears throat> but looking a little bit deeper into pollinators, what are they? Who are they? Uh, when I say poll pollinators, I'm referring to birds, bats, bees, beetles, butterflies, little small mammals, anything that helps to pollinate different plants around the natural ecosystem. These guys play an essential role in plant production. Many plants cannot reproduce without these specific pollinators being around. Uh, plants over time have, uh, or I should say several plants over time, have adapted to specific species that they use. Once those species die off or disappear, that plant now dies off or disappears, and it's a chain reaction down the ecosystem. Uh, pollinators are also responsible for bringing us one out of every three bites of food. That's a kind of shocking statement. But if you think about it on a large scale, even agriculture relies somewhat on these pollinators being around. Uh, things such as apples, squash, almonds, kiwis, avocados, watermelon, and many, many more things. These, growing these types of crops all rely on the presence of a pollinator overall. These, I really like these next two slides because they really kind of illustrate what I'm trying to articulate here. So I'm going to focus on bees because it's been in the news a lot. People are hearing about this a lot. Our bee populations are in drastic reduction at this point due to many uh, environmental factors that are negatively impacting them. So if you look at this grocery store in this shelf, which is full, this is a dairy shelf, okay? So as long as bees are around, you'll be able to buy all these products all the time, but people don't usually connect that little bug to things like this. So let's say we remove the bees, take them all away from their natural habitat, that's your choice. So you'll lose that much just by losing one single organism. If we look at that on another scale, so let's look at produce, for example. So this is with bees, having bees around to help out with that pollination and help these plants to grow. You take bees away, and that's what you're looking at. So pollinators are extremely, extremely important for our uh, food production, and that's on the human side of things. This is not indicating what the impact would be on the natural ecosystem if you remove them. So what's happening to the pollinators? Why is this being, becoming an issue? So a big one is invasive vegetation that's out-competing our native vegetation. Uh, anytime that you bring in a new plant that out-competes a plant that's supposed to be there, it's going to have a tremendous effect on everything that relies on that native species. Uh, for example, I'll use Phragmites as the example. So cattails are of high nutritional value to many animals. Phragmites has zero nutritional value. Nothing eats it, nothing uses it. So it serves no purpose in our ecosystem here as opposed to a cattail that serves as housing and food for many mammals uh, and birds in the area. <clears throat> Erratic uh, climate creates vulnerabilities, so things such as unexpected frost, early or late blooming due to climate change, uh, and the introduction of new pathogens. All these things have uh, tremendous effects on our pollinators. And then the most self-explanatory one would be the use of harsh chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, in agriculture and residential landscaping. 
Uh, it's important to note that this happens both on the residential side, on the individual's property, as well as at the agricultural scale. Both of those kind of contribute to these problems. And there's many different uh, chemical compounds that research has supported that can lead to things such as colony collapse disorder, which can completely decimate uh, a colony of bees or other pollinator um, insects. But, so that's all the bad stuff. So now what can be done? Uh, what are some of the areas that we can make small changes that'll have an impact? So two big concepts, go native and go natural. If you can do that, you're gonna have a tremendous impact on our local ecosystem here. <clears throat> so go native. So uh, use native plants. It's as simple as it gets. Native plants are anything that is supposed to live in Michigan and has historically lived in Michigan uh, over the past hundreds of years. Uh, there are roughly 40 million acres of suburban lawn in North America. So if you think about that, 40 million acres of lawn that should not be there. Because typically lawns are planted in a place that used to be forest, prairie, wetland, something along those lines that does not exist anymore. So by using native plants, you can benefit the local ecosystem. You can support our native pollinators here that depend on those plants. Uh, for you, the plants are adapted to Michigan climate, soils, and water levels. It makes them usually a little bit easier to grow, easier to keep, cheaper. Uh, they can also help manage stormwater runoff, which I was referring to earlier. Uh, and they do that by having the deep roots. So these deep roots that you see in this diagram right here, I have a few non-natives that you can see right here, things such as daylilies, or the worst of all would be turf. Uh, turf, they like to say three inches up, three inches down. You've got three inches of growth above the soil, you've got three inches of roots below, and that's it. Compared to a native grass, such as buffalo, or if you get really big, oops, jumping around here, uh, common nine bark, the root system on a common nine bark is down to almost 16 feet. So that's gonna provide things such as uh, stabilization, it's gonna hold your soil in place, it's gonna aerate your soil, it's gonna allow pathways for water to infiltrate that soil and soak through to the groundwater. And that leads to more groundwater storage, which leads to less water running off of our surfaces and getting into the surface water first. And then finally, you also create native habitat. So I'm sure everybody's kind of familiar with a pollinator garden, which is specifically designed to help these pollinators out, whether it be for bees or butterflies or whatever your target species is. So what to think about when you're looking to go native. Uh, for, there's a lot of different things that you want to take into consideration, but these are just a few talking points. Uh, first of all would be to identify your soil type. Uh, MSU Extension offers soil testing. That's a pretty easy way to figure out what your soil has in it, what it may need or what you may not want to put on. Um, <clears throat> that's step one. Step two would be to figure out your drainage. So find your depressional areas, your low-lying areas. Where does the water pool up? Where does it drain into the ground very quickly? Where does it run off faster or slower? Uh, this will help you to plan out a landscaping design for your yard using different plants that are more adapted to wet or dry climates. Um, <clears throat> an important note is to think about what kind of runoff that you have. So is your runoff going to contain more fertilizers or is it going to contain more road salt? Where is that water coming from? Because that will help you pick what plants are more or less tolerant to those particular uh, pollutants. What colors do you want to see? Uh, that's kind of a personal preference. Do you want something that's going to look very manicured, that's going to look like a natural garden? Or do you want something that's going to end up growing in and becoming a natural wetland or a natural prairie area? That's kind of up to you. Um, <clears throat> and also, depending on what species you want to target, something like a bee is especially going to love purple, blue, white, yellow, mauve. Uh, or violet <clears throat> compared to something like flies will like things that are more flesh colored. So uh, your dark purples, reds, stuff like that. And then as I said earlier, choose plants that can tolerate wet and or dry soils depending on where you're planting. Uh, when does the plant bloom? When do you want to see the bloom? 
and then specific pollinators or other animals you want to attract. So you can attract certain birds, bees, butterflies, stuff like that. You can also build into your garden areas that you can use for reptiles or amphibians, depending on what you want to see, what you want to hear, uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through a few different plants that you may or may not choose to use. Uh, these plants were picked because a lot of people don't believe that native plants can be beautiful and they can give your garden some flavor. Uh, these plants are very colorful and they're very vibrant when they're in bloom. So, great blue lobelia, uh, height about one to four feet. Uh, they bloom July to September and they're blue, as you can see it in the name. Uh, they're about a medium wet plant. So they will attract hummingbirds and bees. So if that's your target species, this would be something that you'd be interested in planting. Uh, one big note, this is why I said that you want to identify what your runoff is going to be composed of. Lobelia is not salt tolerant. So if you're putting this somewhere where you're getting a lot of runoff from the road, especially in Michigan, we have harsh winters, we use a lot of salt, this is not going to be the plant that you want to use. <clears throat> Cardinal flower. Uh, you can see about two, six feet high. Uh, July to October is your bloom time. It's a very, very, very vibrant red. Uh, it's about medium wet again. This will attract hummingbirds as well as butterflies. This one also is not salt tolerant. Uh, we do have plenty of species, native species that are salt tolerant, I should note. <clears throat> Marsh milkweed. This one is extremely important given uh, the fact that it is directly linked to the monarch butterfly and monarchs are already in dramatic reduction. Uh, so marsh milkweed, about one to two feet high. Bloom time is June to September. <clears throat> it's usually a pink color. Uh, medium wet, you can, this will attract bees as well as the butterflies. This has very deep roots, so in a very wet area, this will hold on nice and tight. Uh, it's great for a monarch way station. This is one of the species that's used in those pollinator gardens I was referring to earlier. <coughs> Rough blazing star. This one can get confused for uh, the invasive purple loose stripe pretty easily um, until you get up close to them, then you can tell them apart. But two to five feet high, August to September bloom time. Uh, color is purple, medium dry. These guys you would want to put a little bit more towards an upland area. They will attract uh, bees and butterflies, and they are very drought tolerant. Um, so if you have an area that drains very quickly, but you want to put a rain garden in there, this may be a good option. Canada anemone. This one is uh, one to two feet. This is a more low-lying plant. Uh, they like it medium wet. They attract bees like crazy. Uh, one note is that this will spread very aggressively and it'll fill in a large area very quickly. So if you want to keep this kind of tied down, it'll take a lot of maintenance. If you want to grow an area very naturally, you can plant this. It will take that area over. <coughs> Wild bergamot, or otherwise known as uh, bee balm. Uh, this one is another low-lying plant for the most part, two to four feet. Uh, June to September, bloom time, it's purple, uh, medium dry, so another slightly upland plant. Uh, this one attracts a lot of things, uh, bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and the hummingbird moth, um, which you can see here. Um, <clears throat> it has a very strong scent, and it can be an aggressive spreader, so once again, you would want to keep that in mind, how much maintenance you're willing to put into the garden or not. Um, this one also somewhat resembles an invasive named uh, spotted knapweed, which once again, you can ID them if you get close enough. <clears throat> Common Bonneset, uh, four to six feet, so we're a little bit bigger. Bloom time is August to October. This is a white color. Uh, medium wet, so you can put this a little bit farther down into the rain garden. It'll attract bees the most. And this one is very tolerant of sandy and clay soils. So uh, in Michigan, we do have a lot of clay soils. This would be a good one after your soil test. If you determine it's 90% clay, this is an option. <clears throat> and once again, there are plenty of different plants, native plants that you can use. Uh, columbine, two to three feet. 
uh, May to July bloom time, red color. Uh, it's a medium uh, water need, <clears throat> attracts many hummingbirds. Uh, this is also a deer deterrent. Deer do not like this plant. Uh, they're best in partial shade as well. So shade is another thing that you'd want to take into consideration. You can see the flowers are pretty unique. This plant um, is a pretty good one for a very manicured garden. So some other things that you can do outside of native plants, you can go natural. These are using things such as natural fertilizers, natural pesticides, things that you're not going to go to the store and buy a chemical to dump on your lawn. <coughs> so there are many alternatives. You can find recipes online for just about any alternative you can think of, and most of them are made out of household items. Uh, and they also will help to promote natural nutrient cycling. Uh, within the ecosystem. So the nutrients that you're putting into the ground is not a chemical that we created, it's something that already exists in the ecosystem. Uh, composting is a good example of going completely natural instead of fertilizer. What to think about when you're going natural? Uh, identify the problems that you want to address first. Is it pest? Uh, pest insects? Or is it nutrient deficiency? The nutrient deficiency is something that you can tell using that soil test. So does your soil need something? Does it need less of something? How can you adjust that um, using a natural means? What materials do you already have on hand? Uh, like I said, many of the do-it-yourself recipes use substances that you can find at home. Uh, they're pretty common in anybody's cupboard. Uh, you can develop a maintenance plan ahead of time before the growing season that'll help you kind of get an idea of what you need to do or what you want to do. This is an example of a garden in insect spray made from common household uh, items or stuff that you can get to the local uh, store and it works really well as compared to buying a pesticide that's going to cause larger issues. Um, <clears throat> So you can see the ingredients are pretty self-explanatory. They're pretty easy to throw together. Uh, and your, your footprint that you're going to have on our local waterways, as well as the environment as a whole, is going to be lessened. <coughs> and I can always give you guys the recipe if you want. Composting, I kind of touched on it earlier. A uh, natural way to recycle the nutrients. Uh, without having to send them to a landfill and it also creates a natural chemical fertilizer. So some, I, some things that you can compost, meat, bones, nutshells, they do take a long time to break down in a compost pile but you can compost them. Uh, do not compost invasive species or wood with seeds, that's a big one. Um, a lot of the invasive species that we deal with now that are nuisance or issues for our local environment were brought over unknowingly by people doing things such as composting and invasive species. <coughs> uh, and then obviously dog or cat waste, don't put that in there, but you can compost you know, used or halfway used food items. Um, <coughs> There are some plastic items that will have compostable on the label. Those you can throw in there, but most you can't. Uh, yard waste is a big one, old wood, stuff like that. It just depends on how you structure your compost pile as to what it will break down and how well it will break down. So improving our water quality and pollinator support, they do go hand in hand because those native species, those native plants that I was talking about that are directed towards pollinators will also have that positive effect on our water quality as well. Um, <clears throat> each individual can help with this. A lot of people don't think that they can make a difference on their property. Your property may make the whole difference if you provide an area for monarchs to stop over and you get one or two new monarchs every year. These are some additional sources uh, that I would recommend if you're interested in learning more about any of this. Uh, you can also reach out to us, CRWC. Uh, my card is on the back table, but feel free to check out our website, crwc.org. We'll have plenty of resources on there for you, and you can also find all of our contact information. And with that, thank you for sitting through the presentation. And if you guys have any questions or anything, I can definitely try to answer. Yeah. I have a question. 
we live on a lake. Yeah. And we have a beach. Yeah. But the lake was, uh, it was mined. You know, it was really a gravel pit. So the beach is pretty rocky in that. Yeah. And then, so we, but we get weeds, uh, you know, that grow on the beach. And if you let them go, then they get taller and taller. Can you use, I'm concerned about what we can use in terms of um, a weed killer. Like an herbicide? Yeah, can, you know, I know Roundup isn't, wouldn't be too good. Yeah, Roundup definitely would not be good. Um, there are there are herbicides out there that are, um, they call them water safe or they're safe to use in like a lake situation. Um, if the plant is emergent, which means it's sticking out of the water towards the top. Well, no, this is on the beach itself. Is it coming out of the top of the water or is it all underwater? It's, no, no, it's not in the water. It's down oh, the it's not in the water. The gravel, the gravel okay. Then, yeah, if you can pick, if you have to use an herbicide and you can't pull them or do something along those lines, then try to get an herbicide that is water quality safe. And most hardware stores and places where you'll buy herbicide will have certain things that are aimed towards lakefront property owners. Uh, so try to go that route. Try to use a natural solution. Um, make sure that you're spot spraying. So don't, you know, hose it down. Um, and another thing, a lot of people, they use it for Phragmites, but you can use it for many different plants. It's called a glove of death, <laughs> which sounds really bad, but you take a glove, make sure it's a heavy glove so you don't get it on your skin, but put some of that herbicide on that glove, and then you can actually rub it on the plant. That way there's none getting in the water, there's none getting in the air. You're pretty much clean at that point. Um, if you're doing anything within the lake bed, I should note that most of the time that will require a permit. No, well, our homeowner does that, so. Okay. So I found the most effective way is just I use a hole and just go at it. Yeah. And I do it every couple of weeks. I kind of keep up with it. Rather than go too long, then you get the frog hair, yeah. you know, the real small stuff that you yeah, take for sure. and stuff. So that seems to work. Absolutely, yeah. And that's commendable because that is the most environmentally sound right there. It is the hardest work, but you're having the least amount of impact on that water. So, <clears throat> yeah. This presentation, this presentation won't be, but I can send it to you if you want me to email it to you. Yeah, for sure. And I can come and give this at some time <laughs> if you're interested. So yeah, just shoot me an email and we can set up. We have plenty, well, you know, we have plenty of other presentations as well, so. I will send this to you, yeah, yep. Anything else? No, okay. Well, thank you guys again. <laughs>